Welcome to the Irresistible You podcast. This is the place to get a dose of empowerment to create the life you crave and deserve. My name is Amy with two E's and I am the CEO and founder of Irresistible University. Through my podcast and courses, I teach women just like you how to ditch the body image issues, gain confidence and lose the emotional weight to look and feel irresistible at any size. Welcome to episode 223. Today, we are going to be talking about the power of resilience, why you need to have resilience in your irresistible you, in your weight loss journey in order to achieve your goals. So before I kind of dig into the meat and potatoes, so to speak, of this episode, I wanted to share some personal things that have been going on because that's how I actually came to the topic for this week. Because let me just tell you, <laughs> life has been lifing. So you know how it's just like everything is going well, things are good. Then all of a sudden, everything just starts, the shit just starts hitting the fan. That's a little bit how I have felt lately. Um, I've got a lot going on in my personal life and, you know, there's some, some heavy things too. And last week, so let me just start with today. Okay. My heart is feeling a little heavy today. Today is Tuesday, June 25th, as I'm recording this. And it just so happens to be, this is the three year anniversary of Catalina, my daughter getting diagnosed with type one diabetes. So it was literally three years ago on June 25th, I found out at 3.45 in the afternoon. And it's crazy how your brain can remember those minute details. Like I remember the time because that was her doctor's appointment. And um, it, it's just wild to me like that we've been in this this journey of T1D for three years and how much it's just become part of our life and how much a lot of it has feels now to be second nature, but then also how it also feels like there's never time to breathe and relax because you're always having to check numbers and blood sugars and make sure she's okay. And is she in range? Is she too high? Is she too low? Is she okay? Like, is the sensor wrong? Is it not giving me the right readings? And yesterday, ironically, so <laughs> yesterday she, she's in camp this week and, um, she's in science camp. And so yesterday we got up to get ready for school and she was in a great mood. Everything was going well. And then I hear her crying in her room. I come in there. She's thrown up everywhere. I'm like, Oh geez, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> right. Here we go with the stomach virus. That was my first thought, you know, and, um, I help her clean her up, get her changed. And I text the teachers, you know, she's throwing up. I don't know if it's a bug or what's going on, but I'm going to keep her home. So maybe 20 minutes later, she throws up again. And I'm like, okay, this is a red flag because she was just throwing up water that I was giving her. And anytime you are a type one diabetic and you're vomiting, that is a red flag because yes, it could be a stomach virus, but throwing up with type one diabetes can also be a sign of, um, high blood sugar or what they, which can lead to DKA, which stands for diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay. So I'm like noticing, cause I was all throughout the night, I was noticing her blood sugars were running high. I was dosing insulin in the middle of the night and it, they still weren't coming down. So I'm just thinking sometimes this happens, you get a really stubborn high and it's not coming down. And I noticed that it was starting to go up. And when I say high, she was riding in like the high 200s into the 300s now. And I'm like, okay, the throw up, the high blood sugar, I got to check her ketones. So when you have diabetes, you have to check the ketones in your blood or your urine. And if you have ketones, that is very dangerous because that can lead you into DKA. And when I checked her ketones, when she went to the bathroom, they were the largest, they, like there's a color strip, just like when you test water in the pool. Um, and her ketones were at the largest that they can be. I was very alarmed, very concerned because she's never had ketones since she's been diagnosed. I think maybe once and they were trace ketones and they flushed out like the next time she went to the bathroom. So now I'm worried. She's vomiting. She has high ketones and her blood sugars are not coming down. Like this is, this is not good. Um, 
and she was starting to act lethargic. She was weak. She didn't want to stand up. And I was like, oh my God, she, is she going into DKA? Um, so the day before Sunday, we had a pool day at home and I had put one of these hot pink patches over her pump because it was starting, the tape on it was starting to get loose. So I was like, wait a second, let me look at her pump. And when I went to her leg where her pump is, she has an Omnipod tubeless uh, insulin pump. I smell insulin and I'm like, I shouldn't be smelling insulin. That means the cannula that delivers the insulin into her skin is not all the way in her skin. This is what's going on. Her pump must have either come out in the middle of the night. I don't know how many hours it's been since, um, you know, it's, it's been loose and she's not getting all this, all this insulin I was dosing. She wasn't getting, I'm like, okay, let's change the pump site and see if anything changes. So I change her pump, load her up on insulin again. She vomits a couple more times, like I think two more times after that, but I start to notice a trend in her numbers coming down. I actually, before that I ended up call, after I changed the pump, I called the, um, the 24 hour like emergency endocrinologist hotline that we have. And the first question they asked me is, when did you change your pump? I was like, I just changed it. So they're like, great. A lot of times that's all it is, is that the pump site was just bad. They weren't getting the right amount of insulin. I thought I was going to have to rush her into the emergency room. And in this time they said, well, she keeps vomiting. She's got to come in because if she can't keep liquids down, she's going to get dehydrated. And also, um, you know, that's just, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. So I had already packed my laptop bag. I have my computer. I've got a change of clothes for her. I've got my contact solution. I'm ready to rock and roll and get out this house. So she's finally able to keep liquids down. Her numbers are coming down. It took all afternoon to get her in a healthy blood sugar range. But now she, it's like the life came back in her face. She's feeling good. She's back to herself. She's talking again. She's not weak or lethargic. I'm like, okay, we got through this. The next time I check her ketones, they're still large, but they've gone down. And by mid-afternoon, she's got negative ketones. They're completely flushed out. They're gone. So crisis averted. We didn't have to go to the emergency room. We didn't have to go in the hospital. And the whole time I was thinking, this is so ironic. We're going to be hospitalized one year, like one year from, I mean, three years from the anniversary of when this happened. And, you know, I dropped her off for school this morning and I got back in my car and I started tearing up. I'm like, what is going on? Why am I crying? Like, and it was just the ground underneath of me felt, and it still does a little bit, feels shaky. Meaning, you know, we've been going about this. We've been managing it. We've had some scares here and there. I've never had the, the scare of the high ketones and a potential for going to the DKA. That has not happened since she was diagnosed. And I just felt nervous, like dropping her off at school, you know, just, just feeling again like how vo – just – I don't know if I'm making sense. Revisiting how vulnerable this condition is. This type 1 diabetes, this chronic disease is so vulnerable. And it put that into more of a perspective yesterday, right? How, I don't know how many hours her pump was off, but all it takes is a solid six hours without insulin and you can be in full-blown DKA. And for those of you that don't understand DKA, you could go Google it, but I'll just tell you, you can end up in a coma and ultimately it can take your life if it's not, if it's not treated. And how do you treat? You treat with insulin, fluids, water. Okay. And it only takes six hours. So six hours without your insulin supply and not even, and not even eating, just not having it in your body, period. Right. That's how fast this can happen. And on the flip side of that, when you experience a low blood sugar, that can happen within minutes. You can be in a healthy range and within 20 minutes le or less, you can be running low to a life-threatening low blood sugar, which can cause a seizure, a coma, and potentially death. So it's just this mind fuck of a roller coaster of in type 1 diabetes, there is no 1 plus 1 equals 2 right? I can give her the same food, the same dosing, the same everything for every single day of the week. And 
blood sugars are not going to be the same. They're going to go low. They're going to go high. They're going to stay in range. They're going to be just, there's so many variables and factors that come into the equation, the weather, activity, hormones, stress, adrenaline, you know, lack of sleep. It, there's a lot of factors that come into place. And so this constant feeling of barely keeping your nose above water and not being able to fully breathe because you're always worried, right? Like it, it, it's always there. It's always in the background. And this was just a reminder of how dangerous and how life-threatening and how quickly life-threatening this disease can be and how dependent we are on insulin, right? Like insulin is a lifeblood. It is like oxygen. You cannot live without insulin. And we are at the mercy of the pharmacies and the product. And, you know, I used to really love, like, I still do. I love like apocalyptic theme shows, movies, Walking Dead, Into the World stuff. And since I've become a mom of a type one diabetic, it's really hard to um, watch those shows sometimes because I always put myself in their shoes, like the actor's shoes, and knowing that I don't know what would happen to my child. How long would she have? How how would we find insulin? Like, I'm, I'm willing to go down with a fight. I'm going to take you for that insulin if I have to, right? Like, being in a world like that, it's terrifying. And it just got me really emotional. And it's just been a rough couple of weeks. There's some other things, go, some things going on that I'm not comfortable sharing on here um, that is just kind of hanging over our heads until we have some decisions. Two of my client projects in the last couple of weeks have come to a complete screeching halt. That is my living. That is my finances. That is my, my income. And so that is really freaking scary. So I am, you know, in hustle mode trying, this is for my instructional design clients, trying to get more instructional design clients, which required, it's almost like a full-time job when you are putting proposals out for, for work. I freelance. Um, so putting those proposals out, you know, it's a lot of work and then getting rejected, um, or being told, well, you're too expensive, but yet my, hourly rate was at your high end range that you put on your posting like what <laughs> you know so it's it's really hard i know that there's some things that are those client projects are going to restart but that's not going to help me right now that's going to help me later on in the year so i've got that on my shoulders which as you know anything that does to do with finances is anything with finances and health is a stressor big time and then thursday <laughs> Oh, oh, and last Monday I woke up with a UTI. So that was very pleasant. Uh, got my round of antibiotics done. I'm back to normal, but you know, it's like these pop-up events that I'm always talking about. And so then last week, Thursday, I went to dinner um, with family and my parents and get to the restaurant and I went to turn my car back on to keep the air running. Cause we were still waiting. My car won't start. It's just like, duh, 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 duh. it's shaking. I've had this car for two years now. <laughs> it's had zero problems. It's been 100% reliable. And now my car is the one who is like, no, 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 we're not going to work. We're, we're not doing this. So had to get the car towed. Luckily, I still have a warranty. It's in the shop. No one has called me. It's been there since Friday morning. I haven't heard a word. I called yesterday. They were supposed to call me back. I've heard nothing. So I don't have my car. This is going on with my child yesterday and, you know, it got me thinking and I wanted to share those things with you guys because that's where my brain is. My brain is all over the place with these things that I'm dealing with, but it got me thinking about emotional resilience, right? And that I, yes, I'm stressed out. I have these things going on, but I also am not going to allow these situations to completely like, you know, unravel my entire life, right? The situations suck. They do. But how are you going to deal with it? So I was thinking about resilience and how, um, you know, what is resilience? First of all, resilience is you know, the way that you handle stress, how you handle setbacks and challenges and how you're able to handle them by getting back up 
right? It's how you are able to deal with difficult times. Resilience does not take away stress, right? We're all going to experience stress, trauma, you know, sad events, stressful events, hard things. We're all going to experience that over time, multiple times in our life. But learning how to foster and build your emotional resilience is everything. And I think over the past few years, I've really gotten better at it. I know times in my life, 15 years ago or so, before I started this journey, where everything was doom and gloom. If something bad happened, oh my God, my car's broken and I had a UTI and uh, I, I lost a client and like, woe is me, I'm a victim, boo hoo, blah, 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 blah. And I will have my pity party. I'll feel sorry for myself. I'll have a pity party and be like, all right, bitch, get up. You're, the time is up. You, you wallowed around for today. What are you going to do about it? Get your ass up and do something about it. You know, and I even think about diabetes and the trauma and the grief that comes with finding out your child has a chronic disease and being in the hospital and crying. She's asleep and we're both just hugging each other and we're, we're both crying and we're like, how are we going to do this? And blah, blah, blah. Like our, and in all of that, but going, okay, how do we make this part of our life? How do we make it easier on her? What is the tech? Now I'm Googling, what is the technology? What are the types of pumps? What, what can we do? So my child doesn't have to have 10 plus injections a day, right? I'm doing that through my tears. That is resilience. Resilience is like, all right, you know, my car, like this sucks, right? I need my car. I've got small kids. I got places to be, but it's a car. Right. And once I remembered, oh, yeah, my warranty, they're going to cover it. I only have to pay this much of a deductible. They're going to cover a car rental if I need one. I haven't needed it yet. But OK, that's what I can control. Right. It's it's looking at this sucks. Getting your child diagnosed with type one diabetes fucking sucks. Nobody wants to hear that. No one wants to go through that. Right. But the resilience is, OK, this is the card we were dealt. There is nothing I can do to change this. But what I can do is I can learn how to make the most of it, how to make it the easiest that I can make it for my child, right? That is emotional resilience. Emotional resilience is not putting on rose-colored glasses, living in denial, acting like everything's okay, you know, willpowering your way through. That's not resilience, Resilience is accepting and acknowledging your situation, right? And saying, all right, here we are. I can't control the outcome, right? Even think about weight loss. Here I am. I say I've gained the weight. I got here. There's nothing I can do about like the fact that I already, I already gained it. What I can do is these actions, right? And even if I do all of these actions every single week, the outcome may not be weight loss, I will be okay no matter what happens. And I know that. Like, a car is a car. The car will be fixed. Thank, the, thank you, God, that we have another vehicle. And yes, it's a little stressful what my husband and I can make do and we can share, okay? It's a car. It is a, it's not a life. It's a car, right? Um, clients come and go, right? Money ebbs and flows. And when you are an entrepreneur and a freelancer and you work for yourself you know how it is. You have those feast or famine months, right? It's like sometimes you got so much work coming in that you're working till two o'clock in the morning. You don't know how you're going to get it done. And then all of a sudden you've got two hours of work this week and you're like, holy shit, what am I going to do for August? Right? Cause thinking about when, 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 when the things, the invoices hit. So working for yourself is not for the faint of heart. It is, <laughs> I can only control what I can do. I can't make a client hire me, but I can do my best job with a proposal. I can do my best job networking. I can put my best foot forward, but I can't control the outcome. But no matter what, because I have that faith in me that everything will always be okay. We will always be taken care of. Things are going to fall into place. 
where you get hung up is when you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do when the bills start coming in in August and this is how much I'm going to make this month. And Something's going to come through, but it's only going to come through when you put the work in to make it happen. Okay. So, um, having that resilience is crucial, not only to just your life, your well being. when it comes to emotional eating and weight loss, it is non-negotiable. You have to find resilience. And I would say that not having resilience is a big part of your emotional eating. Because if you're allowing your circumstances to dictate how you feel, then you're jumping into emotional eating because you feel powerless, right? And so a lot of people do that. They let their life circumstances dictate how they feel. And that's hard. That's hard, right? Like, especially when something's happening to your child, everything, like everything in the world is like in, in pause mode for me until my kids are okay. And I always say my family's okay and my kids are okay. Everything else is figure outable. We will figure it out. It's just money. It's just a car, right? More money can be made. Cars can be repaired. Those things are going to figure themselves out. Okay. And if you allow circumstances to control your emotions and your responses, you know, you're going to stay in this constant state of frustration, anger, anxiety, depression. And when you do that, how are you, how are you, um, what are your coping mechanisms for that? You know, you've got, and it leads you into the woe is me, I'm a victim, I'm helpless, I don't know how to do it, blah, 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 low self-esteem, hopelessness. And when you feel that way, you self-sabotage, you give up, and you think, I have no control over the situation, I'm going to just eat. You know, and I tell my kids all the time, like, especially my three-year-old, my son, who's in that, like, you know, the whiny three and a half year old stage. It's a blast. And if he's, I'm like, okay, can you go get this? I can't do it. I said, yes, you can. You can go, like, he'll say, I want a snack. Okay. Go in the, I'll say, go in the pantry and get one of your snacks. I can't. I, I said, yes, you can. You are not helpless. And I tell my children all the time, you know, I will always help them. I will always give them what they need, but there are certain things that they can do themselves. And I want them, even at this young age, three and seven, to understand you are not a helpless person. You can help yourself. You are resourceful. You need to help yourself figure it out, right? Um, and are you born resilient? I, I think some people are naturally more resilient than others, but I think that resiliency is like anything else where it's like a muscle, right? You have to exercise it. You have to use it. You have to practice with it. And over your lifetime, as you are faced with adversity, these are little tests of you of how to be more resilient, right? And, you know, I'm a big fan of taking your adversity and turning it into a purpose or an advantage. Like, how are you going to make yourself better? How are you going to better someone else because this happened to you, right? And if you build your resilience, it is going to help you tremendously on your weight loss journey, on your relationship with food, because you cannot lose weight in a bubble. We are not on the biggest loser, okay? We are not at a facility for 12 weeks where we have no access to anything in life. We're just with our trainer and our nutritionist and our cook, and we're going to lose like 50 pounds in 12 weeks. That is not real life, okay? We have challenging times, and that is often the thing that happens, right? You're, you're eating well, you're losing weight, you're seeing yourself change. And then bam, life is like, oh, hell no, we're going to, we're going to fuck it up for you real quick. And you go back to using food to cope with that situation. You go back to zoning out because you just want to sit there and zone out and eat and not worry about what's really going on. Resilience and building that resilience muscle is going to be like, this really sucks. But I am not going to sabotage my success 
just because this is happening. I can still lose weight. I can still maintain my weight. Like I told y'all, like with the diabetes um, in 2021, I was just maintaining for a while because that's all I could do. So you come to terms with what you need to do. And you can build resilience. You don't have to be born with it in order to get really good at it. You know, having emotional resilience is going to give you the tools to manage your stress without using food to manage your stress, right? Because if you use food to manage your stress, you're just adding on, you're piling up the plate, no pun intended, to what's already on your plate. Because now you're stressed out about overeating, gaining weight, blah, blah, blah. It gives you the ability to regulate your emotions. And I have said it on this podcast so many times from the very beginning that the number one skill that I wish people had, that I wish was taught, is how to regulate and manage your emotions. Because if you can do that, control your emotions, regulate them, it's going to reduce your need or desire or want to use food for comfort. You've got to learn how to be self-aware, how to regulate your emotions and not hide behind your emotions or stuff the food down so you don't have to deal with everything going on in your life, right? And building resilience, you know, I, I told you it's like a practice. It's like a muscle. It's like an exercise. So I want to talk about ways that you can practice this in real life. And one of those is the ability to surrender and let go of control. People hear this and they think, I don't want to surrender. I don't want to accept that this is happening. Surrendering is about acknowledging the situation for what it is. Where you come into turmoil with yourself is when you are resisting it. And resisting it can look like denial. It can look like, um, you know, making it sound better than it is, keeping it a secret, um, you know, sh not sharing with anybody else what's going on in your life because you're embarrassed or ashamed or, or what have you. Surrendering is accepting this is where I'm at, okay? Saying, okay, I got laid off. Right, we'll use that as an example. I was laid off. This freaking sucks, right? I'm scared. I'm nervous. I don't know where my next check's coming from, but it happened and I can't do anything about the fact that it happened. I'm not going to resist it. I have you have to feel the feelings. That is what this is. And so many times emotional eaters, that's the problem is you don't want to feel your feels. You want to run away from them because it's too painful. So you've got to work through it. You've got to go through it in order to get out. And you've got to let go of that control. So, you know, you're surrendering and letting go of control. So it's like, okay, I gain, let's do the weight gain. I gain this weight. It sucks. I can't stand the way I look right now, but here I am. And I can't change the fact that I got here again, right? But what I can do is I can work through it by doing what's going to help me feel better by, you know, eating better, working out, drinking more water, getting sleep, whatever those things are that you're incorporating that you're not doing. And I may not lose weight every week. I can't control that outcome. What I can control, what I do, right? The things that I'm doing, the actions that I'm taking, I can control that. Because as you know, we can, we can do everything quote unquote right and we may not lose weight this week. That's okay. So it's about getting your ass out of denial, getting present, and being here now, right? And that's one of the guiding principles in Irresistible You is to be in the moment. When you tune in and be in the moment through good and bad things, then you're able to show up and you're able to be more present and you're able to accept this is where I am and it's okay. No matter what, I'm going to be okay. The second thing that I do and I think is really important is be grateful, right? Like, so my truck, yeah, I want my car back. I want it back yesterday, <laughs> but I'm grateful that, and that's what I told you in that moment. I was like, okay, let me look up my warranty. I can't remember what warranty I have. Da, 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 da. So 
I was like, I am so grateful that I added that to my um, purchase, right? That I have this, this warranty. I have it for quite a while. It also covers a car rental. It covers the towing. I am so grateful that I have the service. I am so grateful that we have my husband's car. I am so grateful that everybody is healthy and everybody's doing okay, right? So resilient people are grateful people. They can go through difficult times, but they are also focusing on what's also good in their life right now, right? You know, I don't know when certain projects are going to start up again or when I will land new clients, but I am grateful for, you know, everything's paid for, everything's taken care of, there's plenty of food on the table, everybody's got what they need. We may always feel like we don't have enough in the bank or we don't have enough to save or we don't have enough for that big thing we want to do. But then focus on what you are able to do. My kids want for nothing. I am grateful for that, right? And resilient people are grateful people. They can see the gratitude in every situation. They also can see what is it that I'm going to learn from this, right? So there was a proposal I put together last week and it was a very well thought out, very detailed proposal. And I spent a lot of time on it and I said, okay, I may not get this. And if I don't get it, if I get it, fantastic. If I don't get it, great. But I learned a little bit more about the process. Um, I, you know, researched some things about this particular company, learned some things about them. It will be a great learning experience and it'll be a great template for other responses, right? So look at what can you learn from this situation? What can you use to your advantage? What can you do? Um, and it allows you to see opportunities that your, that adversity can give you. It helps you avoid feeling like a victim going back to diabetes, right? Like one thing my husband and I never do is we don't talk negatively about diabetes. We also don't act like it's, you know, the best thing in the world and she's having a hard day. I can say, this is really hard and it's okay to have a hard day about it but you got to get yourself back up, right? Like you have to see how, how can you help other people with this? Like, and I think about the podcast and like why I started this whole thing in the first place was to use my pain for a purpose, to use what I went through being overweight my whole life, being bullied, being ridiculed for my weight and keeping all of that inside for years and not thinking anyone else in the world felt the way I felt until I started writing my blog and started getting people writing back to me and saying, Oh my God, you get it. You see me. I feel, I feel seen. I feel heard. I feel validated. You know, using that pain for a bigger purpose and this podcast platform, like if, if that's what it's here for, like if I can help one person, I've done my job. If I can validate your feelings, I've done my job. If you can see me and my stories and see that there's hope and opportunity, I've done my job because we just want to be seen. We just want to be heard. We just want to be validated. So to be resilient, you've got to surrender, let go of the control. You've got to be grateful and you have to look for the opportunities, the learning experience. What can you learn from this? And knowing that also having the mindset that we can figure this out. Everything can be figured out, right? Um, when Kat was diagnosed, it took about a month that we weren't working, Frank and I, because we were just in full 24-7 management because we had no idea what we were doing. It was hard. You know, she was on vaccine um, injections, so we were, you know, it's taking both of us to hold her down. It was, it was a hot mess. And Javi's seven months old at this point. So that was one of the hardest times of my life. And the bills are stacking up. There's letters coming in about, you know, personal property taxes coming up or whatever the fuck comes in every year that they want your money for. Right? And I would just see the stuff sitting there and I would see the house like piling up, getting, you know, messy. And I'm like, I couldn't, I couldn't see it, if that makes sense. Like I knew it was there, but I couldn't see it because it wasn't my priority. I was just focused on how do I keep this child alive? How do I learn how to live with this? 
that is my goal. We would set one goal a day for the first couple of weeks of like, okay, let's practice going to Target. How are we going to do this with this new routine? How are we going to, like, we would have these, like, goals that would build ourselves up to where, you know, finally now it's like I'm jumping in the car, I'm, I'm dosing insulin while I'm driving down the interstate, and we're doing our adventures and our road trips. Like, that's just how we live, right? It, it nothing changed. Nothing changed in our lifestyle. Um, you know, it was a little bit different for a while, but, you know, less than a month after diagnosis, we were on an airplane going to Texas for a wedding, which was already planned, and it was... <laughs> It was hard. It was hard, but we figured it out. My point in all of this is if I can take care of my kids and make sure my people are good, everything else in my life can be figured out. There's always more cars. There's always more money. There's always other opportunities out there. And if my family's not okay, none of that really matters right now, right? And that's kind of like yesterday. Once that happened and I was in the mindset of, you know, I'm probably gonna have to go to the emergency room and I'll probably be there overnight. Everything else went to the wayside. I like, I'll figure it out tomorrow. So being resilient is knowing you can figure it out, that you will be okay. Find the purpose in your problems. You know, and another tip I would give you is to get support. Like don't isolate yourself in a bubble. Um reach out to friends, family. So if you don't have that, look for support groups, you know, where you can share your feelings and get validated. The first thing I was doing in the hospitals, I was joining Facebook groups for parents of type one diabetics. And when I could see other people that were living their lives, like nothing had changed. I was like, okay, we will get back to that again. I feel validated. Or sometimes it's just to vent where, you know, somebody tells you, your kids should just eat cinnamon and they'll be cured. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And when I put that in a group and every parent in there has experienced that comment, <laughs> it's validating. When you come on this podcast and I talk about weight and body image and what it's like to be fat and be the token fat girl and, you know, be the fat friend while everybody's shopping at the skinny 579 store, you feel validated. That is also support. Like this podcast is a supportive place. And you need to find support to share your feelings and get validated and get perspective. You know, when you see someone that's gone through what you're going through and they're on the other side of it, it's very motivating. It's very inspiring because you know it's possible, right? And I showed Kat while she's laying in that hospital bed, I was like Googling celebrities with type one diabetes, Olympians with type one diabetes, athletes. I was like, look at this person, look at that person, look at this person, look at that person. And one of the coolest things that's just popped in my brain that we found out is that the Disney Frozen movie, which is her absolute favorite Disney movie, the writer, I don't know if he's the writer or the director, I have to look it up again, but when he was writing Elsa, she was originally supposed to be a villain, the ice queen. And his son is type one diabetic. And he used him as inspiration that he's got this thing, like talking about his hands and pricking his fingers and doesn't want people to see the scars and how he felt like he had to hide himself. sorry, <laughs> and how Elsa has this power in her hands and she's embarrassed. She's ashamed of it. And she finally like comes out and is like, this is who I am. This is what I can do with it. And I can make beautiful things with it. And it gave that movie so much more meaning to us. <laughs> so that year um, in 2021, we had planned our first family Disney trip, like a big, big trip. And we were at the Frozen sing-along that they have and in Hollywood Studios. And I'm just like, tears, <laughs> like streaming down my face as they're singing Let It Go. And at the time, seeing my four-year-old, like singing that song and like seeing Elsa on stage and it just gave it so much more meaning, you know? So when you can find connection back to your struggles or your adversity or your challenges or your problems, it just, it, it matters and it makes such a big difference and it helps you see like, okay, 
this person got through it. They're an Olympian. They are an athlete. They're just a regular mom and they're, they got through this too. Like you can get through it as well. So it's, it's resilience. We've got to work on it. We've got to build it. Um, because if you're not resilient and you're not able to bounce back, then you get stuck in your same old shit. You get stuck in your same old cycle and you're going to allow every single situation to derail you from where you want to be and who you want to be. So when you think about, you know, it's not just about losing weight and getting in a certain size. It's about deciding what kind of woman do you want to be? Who do you crave to be? And I crave and strive to be a woman that can get through hard things without falling apart, right? And you're allowed to fall apart for a little bit, right? Resilience doesn't mean you don't fall apart. It doesn't mean you don't get stressed out. It doesn't mean that it doesn't like feel like you're going to get broke. It feels like you're breaking. Yeah, of course. Resilience is acknowledging that, accepting it and saying, okay, like this really sucks right now. And I'm, and I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm going to get through this, but I know that I will. So what can I focus on right now to, um, get through it? And I'll have moments where I feel panicked out of nowhere like, oh, I'm not, I'm not where I should be. I want to be doing this and I want to be doing that. And this isn't going well and that's not going well. I'm like, wait a second, take it back down a notch. And I'll, I'll talk, I'll in my head, think about all the people I care about. Okay, this person's okay. That person's okay. They're doing well. They're doing well. Everybody's okay. Everybody's okay. And you've been through hard things and you can get through this too. So, you know, we're going to have pop-ups in our life, right? We, <laughs> I feel like that's going to go in the glossary of terms for the Ears Is Blue You podcast is pop-up events. You are going to have pop-up events in your life. You can gar- you could go and bet on that. You guarantee you, you have pop-up events every single week. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is you on Sunday night, you're looking at the calendar, you're like, all right, we got cheerleading on this day. Kids got a doctor's appointment, got to take the dog to the vet. Um, I've got this big meeting coming up. I need to prep, you know, prep that document, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the week starts. And as soon as you wake up, your kid vomits. <laughs> you know, um, which for me, it, I work from home, so it's not as big of a stressor. But like for my husband, for example, who doesn't work from home. And yesterday we were like thinking he's going to have to take off so I can get her to the hospital, you know, and, and that's a stressor, right? It's a pop-up event that now we've got to deal with, right? Or you're driving to work and your car breaks down or you get a flat tire pop-up event, <laughs> you know, that you had a certain plan for the week, you had a certain plan and now you have these pop-up events that you've got to navigate in between what you know you already have to get done. And pretty much every single week, every single week, there's some, some pop-up event, right? And, and they don't have to be negative. They don't also have to be negative. It could be you've got these things planned out or you've got your meals planned out and now your friend that you haven't talked to in a while invited you out for happy hour. Oh shit, that wasn't in my plan. Pop-up event alert, right? And I wasn't planning to drink. I wasn't planning to eat out. How am I going to fit that into my my meal plan so I can lose weight this week? Pop-up event, right? Um, You know, so they don't always have to be, you know, negative things. Pop-up events can be just anything that takes you off track of the planned events you had going on like those pop-up sales we always see. (laughs) So what pop-up events are you dealing with? And you have to get good at being resilient in order to navigate those. So going back to the food and the restaurant and the friend, it's like, all right, I didn't plan for this, but I know we're going to go out to eat at such and such place. Let me pull up the menu. You are not a victim. You are not helpless. You are not... Like you're not going to be put in a trance and sent to this restaurant and be like, you will eat all the fattening foods. You're going to gain weight. You better order all the fat shit off the menu. No, like, come on, go online, get the menu and make a decision. And I recommend that 
anytime you're going out to eat, planned or not. Why? Because when I get to a restaurant, I'm distracted. I've got, it, and especially if I got my kids, but if I don't have my kids and I'm with friends and we're talking and carrying on and whatever, um, it's hard for me to focus on the menu. I have such, I'll like read the menu three times and I can't tell you what it says because I'm not comprehending. <laughs> I can get very overstimulated by all the noise, people, the music, the lights. That's just how I am. So I find it's a great practice to always look at the menu so that when you get there and you're overwhelmed, overstimulated, hangry, you're not picking something out of spur of the moment hanger. I like to know in advance, all right, I think I'm going to order this or this. These are my two options, right? Or this is what I know I'm going to get. So again, that goes back to focus on what you can control. You can control what you order. You are not like hypnotized into ordering the double, triple cheese smothered in cream, whatever shit. Like you are not, you are not a victim. You are a fully capable person who can help themselves to get out of that. Right. Um, so that's just another example of, of resilience and how when you practice resilience, you have less dependence on emotional eating and food for comfort. Right. So, oh boy, this was long. This was a long episode, but I felt like I needed to get that off my chest and share with you what I've been going through and how that, cause I was like, what am I going to talk about today? Like nothing is resonating with me. I've been thinking about it all week and nothing's resonating. I, I looked at my list of topics that I have like stashed away and I'm like, eh, not feeling it. Cause I have to feel the topic that I'm talking about. Otherwise I can't, it's hard for me to podcast otherwise. So it got me thinking about resilience. I'm like, okay, cause I can't just vent. I don't want to just have a vent session about what I'm going through. Let's talk about something relevant that everyone can learn from. So yeah, uh, I think that's going to be it. <laughs> I think that's it for now. All right. So, um, what was I going to say? I'm losing my mind. I'm losing my mind. End of the episode. Let's stay connected. The two social medias where we can stay connected is the private Facebook group. That is a discussion group. I'm trying to bring life back into that group. It's been really tough um, as reach and everything on social media is just a joke these days. It's pathetic. Um, and it's very unfair that they're doing things the way they do. But anyway, I've got that group. I've also got Instagram at Irresistible Icing. That's my main, my main place to be. I love Instagram stories. I I'm probably in there almost every day. So connect with me over there. You could shoot me a DM. Also, if you love the podcast, please leave a rating and review on your podcast player if that's available, if that's an option that they have. If you don't know how to subscribe or you don't know what app to use, maybe you're listening from the desktop or from my website, I recommend Amazon Music. That is where I get all of my podcasts. And if you're an Amazon Prime member, you already have access to Amazon Music for free. You just have to download the Amazon Music app. And if you're not a Prime member, I have a 30-day free trial in the show notes. Sign up um, and you can you can take a look at that. And, and that's the only place I listen to music and podcasts these days. I love it. So anyway, I hope that you all have an amazing week. I will catch you in the next one. Until then, stay irresistible. Bye, guys. <laughs>